five, temperament is a really good way of understanding what makes a person very unique. However, when we look at these nine dimensions, we see there is very much a lot of overlap. We know that an individual who is low in attention might be also lower in persistence or higher in attention might be higher in persistence. We know that some people that are really high in reactivity might be lower in affect. And we know that somebody who is highly sensitive might be low in adaptivity and might be more rigid when it comes to rhythmicity. And so because of this, Thomas and Chess quickly noted that there was a large degree of overlap between these nine dimensions. And it might be better not to so much talk about these nine dimensions, but to talk about three types. And so the three types of temperament, as described by Thomas and Chess, was really taking how those nine dimensions could cluster into three types. And it was thought that every infant could be considered one of these three categories. And the original names were easy, difficult, and slow to warm up. But now we tend to prefer to call them resilient, under-controlled, or resistant to control, and over-controlled. So the easy or resilient infant is one that's going to be in the pretty moderate zones on a lot of those nine dimensions. They're moderately active, they're moderately on a schedule, they're high in adaptability, high in approach, they're moderately soothable, but pretty persistent too. And they're just the infants that are easy to get along with. They're the ones that are gonna be pretty content. You can take them new places. They're not in a bad mood. Their affect is more towards the positive end and they're not highly reactive. And things are pretty easy to go along with them. The reason why we tend to call them resilient is because they're resilient to the environment. They can go to new places, experience a diverse types of things, and they're still content. As compared to them, we have what was previously called the difficult infants, though we don't like calling the infants difficult today. We find that pretty faux pas. So we tend to call them now under controlled or resistant to control. And what's going on here is they may be colicky. They may have extreme negative reactions to things. They might be very sensitive, very low in adaptivity, very much on a rigid schedule. They also might be extremely active and extremely non-soothable. And so what's happening here with these infants is they are resistant to control. They are going to be them regardless of the situation. So to compare here, our resilient kids are resilient regardless of what the environment is like versus our resistant to control kids respond very heightenedly to the environment and they are going to maintain who they are and their preferences regardless of what's happening in the environment. They need the environment to address their needs rather than the inverse. They're not going to address the demands of the environment. They need the environment really to step up and respond to them. And the third type was often called the slow to warm up, but nowadays more so referred to as the over-controlled infants. And these are the infants that, as long as everything's pretty much the same, they're content. These are the infants that are pretty content when they're home with their caregivers, but they are low in adaptivity and low in sensitivity. And so when something novel happens, they just need a little bit longer to engage with that and to handle the shift but they're not the same as the resistant to control infants. They're a little bit of a different process. One way that researchers have considered this is if you think about a string instrument, if you think about a string instrument where the strings are wound too tight, that is really our over-controlled or slow to warm up infants. If you have a harp or a guitar and things are, the strings are just too tight, you're not gonna be able to play good music, the strings can't vibrate at all. And over-controlled infants, that's kind of what's going on. They're, they're so tense and they tend to be way more anxious and their stress hormones are a lot higher. And so because of this, they're just always overstimulated in their environment. These tend to be our infants that go on to become very shy and very introverted, which is why they tend to be lower in approach and lower in adaptivity. And so they are just constantly on the alert and just overstrung out. In comparison, the under-controlled infants, you can think about a string instrument where the strings are just not wound tight enough. You can't play music on it because the strings are too loose. And so you really need to respond to their needs before anything else can happen. And these might be the children that go on to have a diagnosis of ADHD, or they might have other conduct problems or other externalizing or aggression problems later on. And finally, if you think about the resilient kids, those are the ones where the strings are tuned properly and everything is working out and everything's kind of sailing along quite nicely. But that being said, there is a lot of criticism of these three types. For instance, we now know that difficult is just such a bad name for one group of kids because there could still be an environment that is very complementary to their needs. And so the most cutting edge way we like to look at this nowadays is through goodness of fit. And this is really how much we fill a certain niche. 
And so this is the idea that every person is unique. Every person has somewhere different on those nine dimensions of temperament. And rather than coding them as over controlled, under controlled or resilient, we could really see them as an individual with individual needs. And does their environment support those individual needs? And so this is the idea of how well do you fit in your puzzle piece? Some families are very emotional and very vulnerable and they talk about these mushy, gooey feelings all the time. Some families are very cynical and they like to have banter and sarcasm and they like to tease each other. And we can imagine if there was a sort of a swished up birth situation and a very mushy child got placed in a very cynical and sarcastic family, they might not feel so good about that. Versus if a sarcastic kid was placed in a very mushy, gooey family, they also might not feel so good about that. And so it's not so much about something wrong with the individual, but more of a disconnect or incongruence between the individual and their environmental needs. And so we can especially see this when we look at shy versus outgoing children. If we have a very outgoing child who constantly wants to go out and have playdates, but they have a very introverted family. This thinking back to the gene environment correlation and the gene environment interaction. And if they need to have that active gene environment correlation, where they need to spring forward and really find that social element on their own, because staying at home with their book nerd parents is not fulfilling to them. We can also see that really shy individual who doesn't want to have a lot of play dates, but their parents are constantly bombarding them with social engagements and hosting lots of parties, and they really feel overwhelmed by that. And so this is the idea that if you have a, a passive gene environment correlation, it's going to be an outgoing family with an outgoing kid, that's going to be a goodness of fit versus a really shy kid with a really shy parent, that's also going to be a gene environment passive correlation and a good goodness of fit. Versus when we get to those reactive and active gene environment correlations we talked about in unit two, that's really when we might not have such a good fit unless there's certain things we do, unless the parents start to realize and they start to react to the needs of their child. So the really outgoing parents kind of settle down a little bit and don't overstimulate their shy kid, or the really shy parents really push themselves to allow more social stimulation for their very outgoing kid. That allows them to modify the environment and be very sensitive and responsive in their parenting style. And today, this is what most social emotional researchers recommend is that the parents try and be very sensitive to the needs of the individual child and to respond accordingly and provide that complementary environment. So really leaning into the passive or at least a reactive gene environment correlation, not making it on the child's onus to go out and have that active correlation. We can see this beyond childhood. Of course, you can see this when you're an adult and you're in the workforce, you might have a job that's just not a good fit for you. And it's the idea it's a very fine job for other people, but it doesn't speak to your aptitudes or your interests or your work style. Maybe it's too structured. Maybe it's too team focused or too individual focused. Maybe it's not creative enough. Maybe it's too focused on the details and there's nothing wrong with you. It's just the fact that the demands of your environment don't fit your temperament or don't fit your personality. When we think about those under controlled or resistant to control infants, it's important to understand we shouldn't be labeling them as difficult more so we should be looking at what are the needs of this child and how can the environment be modified to address that. Some of those children might not do well sitting still in a classroom and remaining quiet all day, but they might do fine when they get to be physical or move with their bodies while they're learning. Some individuals might have a hard time with lots of sensory stimulation, but they're okay in a sensory reduced environment. So it's more so thinking about what are the environmental changes that can be made reasonably to help this child to thrive.